The beautiful but treacherous waters surrounding the island Mauritius, some 500 miles east of Madagascar, have been visited by countless ships, many laden with treasures. More than 600 of those visitors never returned home. Buffeted by wind and wave against sharp coral reefs, they sank instead to the bottom, carrying crew and passengers. This film is about one such wreck, the French ship saint Geron, which sank in turbulent waters on August 16, 1744. Dutch, French, and English trade routes followed the west coast of Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope, and then north to Mauritius. Old drawings and nautical charts depict early fleet comings and goings, as well as other port activities. This monument is dedicated to the first Dutch settlement on Mauritius in 1698. The French took over in 1715, followed by the British in 1810. Independence came in 1968. The original Dutch settlement now lies submerged under this area. Paintings by early artists depict French and English trading ships visiting Mauritius. The Maritime Museum in Port Louis, the island's capital, holds cannon and timber from an English ship sunk by the French in 1810. A typical street scene in Port Louis. Most of the island's residents are from India. A Hindu chapel. Hindu is a common language on the island. Sugarcane, the island's major product, is still harvested and transported as it was in bygone days. There's excellent diving off Mauritius and spear gun fishing is a popular pastime. The area is also a paradise for shell collectors, as shown by these finds. The golden cowrie is valued up to $300,000. The seas around Mauritius are beautiful, but can be cruel. It was on an offshore barrier reef that the St. Geron met her fate on that long ago tropical night. This is an island off the coast where most of the survivors of the St. Geron were found several months after the shipwreck. Even today, ships continue to be wrecked in the waters around Mauritius. This view shows a portion of the reef where the St. Geron was lost. The ship was bringing the first sugar refining equipment to the island along with considerable treasure, when jagged coral ripped out the bottom. She sank in minutes, carrying with her 35 passengers and crew members. As this replica shows, the St. Geron was a classic 18th century cargo sailing ship. In addition to treasure, she also carried desperately needed staples. However, islanders found only debris and bodies that early morning of August 17, 1744. A widely read novel, Paul and Virginia, relates the story of two young Mauritius lovers. Virginia, returning from school in France, died when the St. Geron sank. This period painting shows her body washed ashore. This cemetery on Mauritius contains the remains of passengers and crew of the St. Geron. Cyclones have damaged or destroyed many of the old grave monuments. Here, a visitor examines the resting place of a young St. Geron officer. This statue commemorates the love of Paul in Virginia and her tragic death. This is an original copy of the book, Paul in Virginia, written by Bernadine St. Pierre in 1788. 
In France, it is a classic, equivalent to America's Gone with the Wind. It has been published in 200 editions and many languages. Gift shops offer countless Paul and Virginia items for tourists. Jean-Yves Blow, a French underwater archaeologist and leader of the six-month expedition to find the saint Geron, spent a year doing historical research in France and Mauritius before beginning the underwater search. This reference is to the saint Geron. This house served as operations center for the expedition. $80,000 worth of necessary equipment was flown in from France. It ranged from scuba gear, compressors, and metal detectors to a radio-controlled aircraft containing a surveillance camera. This is Jean-Yves Blow. His wife Maria was both diver and photographer. Christian Blow handled logistics, this is Mimi, Christian's wife. Bob Marks, internationally known American underwater archaeologist, was technical advisor and cameraman. Attorney Henry Holmes and others completed the expedition. The group studies various charts deciding where they want to dive and search. The charts pinpoint various wreck sites. A remote control model airplane fitted with a camera was used to take aerial photographs over potential wreck sites. This was the first time the system had been used for this purpose. Many wreck sites were captured on film by the plane's camera. The prints showed shallow ballast piles, cannon, anchors, and other artifacts. After examining the photographs, expedition members took to the air in a conventional aircraft to survey the same area and to verify various locations. They now had many places to search in the general area where the St. Geron went down, and now it was time to get divers in the water for close-up reconnaissance. After finding a potentially good site for the St. Geron, a diver entered the water. His job was to scan the area for artifacts that could be easily examined and identified and, it was hoped, associated with the St. Geron. Towed by a boat, he could cover much more territory than by swimming. Maria entered the water and worked her way toward the ocean floor. She moved slowly and carefully, trying to spot evidence of a wreck while keeping a close watch for sharp coral and dangerous eels and sea snakes. Colorful fish darted about through the brilliant tropical vegetation. Maria's careful search paid off with a coral encrusted silver spoon, but it was not from the Saint Geron. Another diver snorkeled down from the surface to take it to the boat for closer examination. Maria continued to find other artifacts as she moved slowly over the area. 
She retrieved a cannonball and placed it in her recovery bag. Other divers soon joined the search. One found the bottom of what seemed to be an early wine jar, while Maria spotted and collected still another cannonball. Following archaeological research methods, Holmes carefully examined and measured clumps of conglomerate. During the expedition, great care was taken to follow established underwater archaeological procedures to preserve and document the historical significance of the wrecks. Among the many finds were a fork, gold and silver coins, a gold thimble, and a small piece of gold chain. Despite the variety and obvious age of these artifacts, these items were not brought to the waters off Mauritius by the St. Geron. The expedition quickly moved to another promising location nearby. The advantage of using scuba gear rather than snorkel gear was that divers could get below the rough waters to search more easily and safely. The divers began a careful search of this wreck site. Most of them carried a small geologist pick for chopping out pieces of coral encrusted metal. One diver collected a small piece of conglomerate, while another found a large piece of metal, probably part of the ship's fireplace. Maria also bagged another find. Hundreds of old and new coins were found at this location. Since the expedition was working on the windward side of the island, storms sometimes hampered searching. The expedition was also searching for a fleet of Dutch ships wrecked in the pounding surf at another location in 1614. The ships carried gold and silver, plus a huge cargo of Chinese porcelain. Within only a few hours at this new site, the divers from the expedition began to discover assorted artifacts from one of the Dutch ships. Among these were several ancient cannon and bronze ships fittings. The divers began a close inspection of the area. One of the divers used a hammer to pry loose a coral covered pistol. while another used a water jet to uncover pieces of porcelain and china and to blast away sand, shells, and other overburden from where cannon were lying about. Underwater metal detectors, equipped with a handheld search coil, are extremely useful in defining the perimeters of a sunken wreck and in locating both large and small metal objects. Carefully fanning away the sand, this diver detected and recovered several old coins from the shipwreck site. The continuing search revealed a variety of objects. Many pieces of porcelain, broken chunks of bottles, lots of coral encrusted metal, and other debris and valuables lay only a few inches under the sand. Anxious to continue the search for the St. Geron, the group decided not to excavate this site further, but to make only a hurried examination for items easily seen on the surface. A small portion of the many colorful pottery shards recovered from this one wreck site were displayed and examined. Discussion about where to look for the St. Geron continues. Louis Quacko, a local diver, 
suggests a good location where he has recovered many artifacts. Some expedition members visited Lewis's collection of finds he made at one location. Among these were a flintlock pistol and numerous cannonballs. After extensive examination and discussion about where they were found, Jean Eves believes chances were very good that they came from the primary target, the Saint Geron. The group made one more aerial reconnaissance before renewing their search. With hopes raised that remnants of the Saint Geron might lie just a few feet below, a team of divers entered the water and began their descent to the ocean floor. A photographer documented the search. Bob Marks took his underwater detector along and lost no time in putting it into operation. He was kept busy alternately searching with the coil and brushing away sand and shells when signals were received from the many pieces of metal, valuable and otherwise, that littered the location. Thorough methodical searching was the name of the game. A huge anchor dominated the site. The meticulous searching and hand digging continued and soon paid off when divers began finding coins. This one carefully pried a Spanish pillar dollar from the almost cement-like coral and shells that have held it for centuries. Also near the anchor, another diver found numerous pillar dollars. In a nearby location, Marx located valuable coins from an earlier era. He carefully placed them in a snap-type bag for safekeeping and later close examination. Cannons sprawled everywhere, like toppled giant bowling pins. There were also a variety of unwanted guests in the diver's midst. The divers were totally fascinated by the cannon examining them as closely as possible in the underwater environment. 28 lay scattered about, all belonging to the St. Geron. Divers came to the surface periodically to take a much needed break and to examine their finds more closely. This collection included coins and a variety of grape shot or pistols belonging to the St. Geron's crew. Detailed measuring of finds and notations of their location, individually and in relationship to others, was essential to diagram the wreck site for continued and future exploration. This diver carried a grid pole. A grid was laid out for the taking of photographs and to make certain that all areas were thoroughly searched. Meanwhile, the time-consuming task of measuring all the many cannons continued. There was also work going on at the surface. A theodolite was used to pinpoint and verify the wreck's location so the most accurate map possible could be drawn. 
divers would attach a buoy to a cannon, and when it came to the surface, the theodolite operator could take an angle on it to help plot a chart of the site. This expedition member worked to complete the map which would give the group a good idea of where the ship hit the rocks and how it broke up. These marks indicate the anchors and the cannon. Back on the reef, divers continued to search for artifacts which would be cleaned, treated to resist the elements, and then cataloged. These galley utensils were among the other items found. Coral encrusted cannonballs were much easier to find than they were to clean. Various types of artifacts were found. Even wooden lanyard guides called dead eyes were among the finds. Meticulous documentation continues. Some of the expedition members were almost always at the site, trying to make certain that everything of value and historical significance was recovered. A water jet was again brought into action to remove sand, shells, coral, and other overburden. The strong pressure of the water jet and the constant surging current made this an extremely difficult task. Each site section and each find it contained was photographed as it was cleared. This gold ring, found at one of the cleared sites, glistened as if it had been dropped only a few moments before. Use of the water jet continued. One of the divers found a small gold chain with a diamond pendant. Sapphires and a gold thimble were part of the many treasures recovered. Artifacts were common finds. These included utensils, nails, pottery shards, and other items. This imposing gold medallion was a crest of office. In addition to the water jet, the divers used a large suction dredge to clear out overburden. Scores of hungry fish were ever present to feed from the material stirred up by the dredge. It was a slow, methodical process, but there was always the possibility of many new and unusual discoveries. The underwater photographer was kept busy, recording each find in place before it was removed and taken to the surface. Divers often resorted to hand fanning in small, isolated sand pockets. This technique produced many items such as coins, jewelry, nails, and other artifacts. After excavation, photographs were taken for a highly detailed mosaic of the wreck site. As soon as the mosaic was available, it was closely examined. It provided the most accurate data available about the wreck site layout and perimeters. This ordinary looking material is what a clump of pillar dollars looks like when it has been brought up from the ocean floor. Several thousand of these coins were found. Even before they were cleaned, they proved fascinating to everyone who viewed them, adults and children alike. It should be mentioned that every item taken from the St. Jean's watery grave 
was put in the Maritime Museum on Mauritius. Nothing found left the island. The expedition spent only six months on the island, exploring the many wrecks that dot the treacherous reef, but they will forever remember the ill-fated St. Geron and the story of the young lovers, Paul and Virginia. Hello, I'm Charles Garrett. This is one of the most successful books that I have ever written. It's called Treasure Recovery from Sand and Sea, and it deals with water hunting for treasure near, in, and under the waters of the world. Even before the book was published, I knew that it would be successful. Why? because I could see that men and women were growing steadily more interested in hunting with a metal detector in and near the water. They eagerly sought suggestions and instructions that would help them. The book deals with all aspects of water hunting. This includes the beach, surf, oceans, rivers, lakes, streams, ponds, and just about everywhere else associated with water. It's a simple, straightforward, how-to book designed to answer questions for both the novice and professional alike. The following slide presentation was developed to cover basic material presented in the popular book. In it, I present an overview of water hunting. I hope that you will enjoy it. Treasure recovery from sand and sea. That's what it's all about. It's fun, it's rewarding, and it's a new frontier for treasure hunters. We can search beaches, under the sand, in shallow water, and even in the deep ocean with metal detection equipment now available. Millions of dollars in lost treasure lies beneath water and sand. Let me show you how to recover some of this treasure. This magazine cover indicates the worldwide popularity of treasure hunting in the water. It features a 17th century Spanish icon that is one of my most valuable finds. I discovered it on a Caribbean island beach. These rings and jewelry items were found by a Canadian couple searching on beaches and in the water with metal detection equipment. Notice the large assortment of valuable rings found by a successful West Coast treasure hunter. Note the four watches. Of course, this represents only part of what this man has found by searching beaches and in shallow water. Jack is smiling for a good reason. Since he began searching beaches three years ago, he has found all the treasure shown here. Jack was a land hunter until he began scanning the surf at Galveston, Texas, where his finds were so impressive that he now searches mostly in the water. Famed treasure hunter and underwater explorer Robert Marks sent me this photo of Spanish coins he found on a Florida beach. This bronze Spanish cannon is worth at least $25,000. It pays to search in the water. Here's your hunting territory. It's divided into three sections, just like the rest of this presentation. Zone one is the dry sand beach area. Zone two is the shallow surf extending out as far as you can walk. 
Zone 3 is deep water scuba territory. Let us look first at beach hunting, Zone 1. On the island beaches of Cozumel, I found treasure, but I also found solitude and contentment. Make a trek to some remote beach and see for yourself. Or you can search a beach like this where thousands are enjoying the water and sun while they lose valuable possessions. Coins drop from pockets, rings slide off oily fingers, chains and bracelets fall into the sand. This treasure remains lost until you come along with a metal detector and locate it. Notice the silver religious articles and rings found by a successful treasure hunter. By studying beaches you will learn tricks that lead you to such silver items or to beaches with gold or even turquoise jewelry. Learn where people flock and what they wear. If you want to find gold, go where people wear gold. This beautiful twin cluster diamond ring was found by a Florida beach hunter. These rings were all found in one summer season by a single beach hunter who also found hundreds of other pieces of jewelry, plus thousands of coins. Here's the icon I found in the Caribbean the Virgin Mary and Christ Child. It dates to about 1690. Knowledge I had gained over the years, combined with my ability to research and reason why treasure might be found in a certain area, these all combined to lead me to it. I urge you to read the full story in my book. Beach hunters often find unusual items such as this pipe concealed in a seashell. Apparently, some marijuana smoker had the pipe hidden so that quick concealment was possible just by laying it on the sand. This object, found by Art and Marlette Steinke, proved to be a coral-encrusted gun, as shown in an x-ray. These knives, watches, and digging tools are typical of some of the other items you'll find on the beach. This is a standard configuration metal detector with coil and stem attached to the housing. I recommend, however, that you not work in the water with this type detector. Even though all Garrett search coils are waterproof, water, and especially salt water, will destroy the electronic printed circuit boards of any detector unless, of course, it is submersible. And this one is submersible. It's the Garrett Sea Hunter. The model shown here is hip mounted with a long stem for searching the beach. This detector is not affected by salt water and can be submerged as deep as 200 feet. Another instrument designed for the beach is the Garrett AT3 Beach Hunter. This is an all-terrain model that is not affected by rain, sand, blowing dust, or shallow water. Notice that headphones are being used. They are a must, of course, for successful metal detecting anywhere. But headphones are absolutely essential on the beach or in the surf. Where do you search on this beach? First of all, look where people congregate and where they play. That's where you'll find treasure. Make it a habit to survey the beach during the times when people are present then you'll know where they have left their treasure. Here you can see other places where a treasure can be found, such as the rocks that prevent beach erosion. Items become trapped here because high tides and waves can't wash them back into the water. Here's a close-up of another protective barrier. See if you can develop a recovery tool that lets you retrieve coins and jewelry from the rocks where they lie trapped after having been tossed here by winds and waves. This is a trough, just a low place in the sand. But here your search coil can get closer to treasure. 
It's not far from the truth to imagine a blanket of treasure lying beneath the sands on every beach. The closer you can get your search call to it, the more apt you are to find treasure. Since water is lying along here, it is obvious that this is a continuation of the low place. Troughs lie parallel to the beach. There's probably one or two farther out. More valuable, heavier treasure is generally found in the troughs farthest from shore. Tree roots are another good place to find treasure. They're popular places to play and they keep winds and waves from washing objects out. On the west coast of Italy, prevailing winds blow sand off this beach inland to a retaining wall. This presents an excellent time for searching when sands are at their shallowest. In the spring, the townspeople use earth-moving equipment to redistribute the sand over the beach. Unfortunately, the day I searched was shortly after bulldozers had pushed all the sand back. Had we arrived just a few days earlier and been ahead of the bulldozers, we could have recovered many more coins and items of jewelry. Valuable Spanish treasure was found here in this low spot where the men are standing, where sand has been washed back into the surf. Hundreds of years ago, the treasure was swept ashore from a shipwreck and buried by wind and tides. On the day my friend was searching, Winds and waves had washed away enough of the sand to permit his search call to get closer to the treasure and detect it. So, don't forget to look for washes such as this. Here are 500 Spanish coins found just after a storm in a wash on a Florida beach. All were in one cache that may have been buried 300 years ago. Try to work beaches after storms because that's when high waves and winds have removed sand and permitted you to get closer to the blanket of treasure. Now, it's time to go into the surf, zone two, where you can search in the water as far out as you can walk. To search in the surf, you'll need a detector that is submersible to at least four feet. Here's a nice collection of rings and religious items found in the water. And here's a beautiful diamond cluster ring from the surf. This Rolex watch, worth more than $5,000, was found with a metal detector in shallow surf. Here's an unusual item found in shallow water off Virginia Beach, Virginia. It's a spy ring. See how the ring opens up? A small groove is revealed where microfilm can be hidden. When traveling in Europe, we always visit Garrett dealers such as this one in Marseille, France. She had just been searching in the surf. And here are the gold items that she found that very day. Treasure hunting is an international hobby. In shallow water, you'll need equipment that is waterproof. This girl is using the Garrett AT3 in a hip mount configuration. The S-shaped long handle lets her carry and maneuver the search coil along the bottom. This treasure hunter is using the Garrett Sea Hunter underwater detector adapted for use in the surf. Let's study some more areas of the beach to get a better idea about where to search in shallow water. Remember the troughs? Can you see them in this slide? Look at the long one running the length of this photo. You'll notice it contains water here and here and here. If you work the beach here, where the blanket of treasure may be four or five feet beneath your search coil, you probably won't find it. But you get closer to it in this trough and your chances of finding hidden wealth improve. Notice water running out of the trough here. Treasure can accumulate along this channel. Water will slow down as it flows back into the ocean 
and let treasure fall out. Study this photo and see if you can locate several likely places to search for treasure. Rocks make a perfect barrier for treasure when it is lost or tossed here by winds or waves. Now, what is this? It is a tidal pool and an especially interesting one. Because it is depressed, you can get closer to treasure and these rocks form natural barriers where coins and jewelry can be trapped. Notice this trough that runs parallel to the water's edge. But look at the water flow along the trough and note where it flows through a channel back into the ocean. Search this area for treasure. See the post? They are perfect for trapping treasure the same way that treasure is trapped in rocks. Search along the post in the water. This is a tide table. It will let you know when tides are lowest because that's when you want to search along the water line. Twice a day the ocean recedes, leaving more beach exposed. Tide charts are published in newspapers and are available in fishing and dive shops. Now, put your scuba gear on and let's go out into the deep water. Many valuable treasures can be found in scuba territory. These household items were brought up by Robert Marks from Port Royal, which is a sunken city. Look at these Spanish coins from an underwater shipwreck site. Each has three holes. They may have been fashioned into some sort of jewelry worn centuries ago. This large assortment of coins, jewelry, and other Spanish items were found by a successful Florida diver. Here are some gold bars that are part of the cargo of the Spanish treasure ship Atocha, discovered in 1987 by Mel Fisher and his crew. Here is more treasure from the Atocha, which went down off the Florida Keys in 1622. These are large silver bars and Spanish coins called pieces of eight or cobs. This diver has located a bronze cannon. Remember, we learned that even the least valuable of these is worth $25,000. These bottles can't be located by your metal detector, so keep your eyes open for them. They're valuable. Here I am searching a Spanish shipwreck site off South America. Look closely and you'll see more than a dozen cannon stacked like cordwood. Here is the open barrel of one cannon. They are the cargo of a ship whose bottom was ripped open by a reef 300 years ago and they bear three centuries of coral incrustation. At this site, coins were found in clumps of coral along with other valuable artifacts. Working in coral is one of the most difficult types of recovery when every item must be chipped from the razor sharp rock. The easiest form of underwater treasure recovery is in sand. You can dig with tools as this individual is doing. Often it is as easy as fanning with your hand to recover treasure. Now let's consider lake hunting for just a moment. You might find it more profitable than you imagine. Here are some treasures taken from a lake after being lost by swimmers long ago. All of this treasure came from a lake in North Texas. Notice the rings, jewelry, coins, keys, and even a camera lens. Many items can be found in lakes. Here I'm searching for a dozen slot machines discarded in 1919. This complicated search utilized scuba gear and shore to diver communications. Searching rivers has proven rewarding for many treasure hunters. 
These Civil War projectiles came from the bottom of an Alabama waterway. Here are some artifacts found by a river searcher in Florida. Notice the gold item. Some items are silver and others non-metal. This man is an FBI agent using a Garrett Master Hunter detector equipped with a depth multiplier attachment to increase depth capability. He was recovering items discarded in a shallow West Texas stream. There are many forms of specialized hunting in and around the water. Here we are working a rock quarry with Garland, Texas police. We found many items including a safe whose top you can see. We also found two vending machine coin changers and this. Can you guess? An automobile. It's upside down and you can see its shape beneath the tubes being used to bring it to the surface. This of course is a typical swimming pool. I encourage you to search these for lost coins and jewelry. Using only a mask, fins, and snorkel, you can swim along the bottom and search for lost treasures. You'll need some sort of recovery tool to fish items out of the strainer, which is usually 8 to 10 inches below the bottom surface of the pool. Beach hunting requires several kinds of recovery tools, such as shown here. And don't forget those headphones. When searching the surf, however, you'll need a long handle scoop like this model with excellent design, including a looped handle that I prefer. This particular model is ruggedly constructed and offers three handles. Long for use when standing, medium for shallow water, and a short handle that converts it into a hand scoop. When you invest in underwater recovery tools, remember that a good, rugged, professional scoop is a necessity. This underwater search coil can be attached to the Garrett Master Hunter detector by long cable. It can be lowered to depths of 50 feet and is especially popular for searching for such items as sunken boats, motors, guns, and toolboxes. Searching beaches and along and under the water is a delightful way to pursue the hobby of treasure hunting with a metal detector. It's our newest frontier and certainly one of the most rewarding. I sincerely hope this presentation has given you veteran water hunters a few new tips and ideas. For those who haven't yet searched the water, I hope this book and my presentation stir up your curiosity about treasure that awaits you on the beach and in lakes, rivers, and the ocean. Of course, I hope you'll read my book, but regardless, I encourage you to join us. You may find water hunting a great way to fill your treasure pouch. Thank you again for letting me join you. In closing, I'd like to remind you that we at Garrett are dedicated to treasure hunting and to helping treasure hunters. Should you at any time need the help of us at Garrett, please do not hesitate to call. We'll be glad to help. And until we meet again, perhaps in the water, good hunting.